Well, good morning, Southside. We have a beautiful message from the Word of God this morning, asking Him to bring transformation into each one of our hearts. And so um, I prayed about whether we should stay in Romans or pull out and focus on what has been going on with the Stephens family. But I, I think by the time I'm finished, everyone who knows Ruth will agree that this is a, a passage that summed up her life very, very well. If you're visiting with us, we're grateful to have you here to worship with us. Uh, I pray that this word from Romans this morning would build you up in Christ. I wanted to give you kind of a heads up that I, I will not be here next week. I'm going to be in Arizona teaching at a conference and would ask for your prayers for that time that the word would move deeply on those who would hear it. Uh, Sunday school, we're continuing to work through a call to mission, and so we're joining our hearts and learning and studying how to share the beautiful news of the Lord Jesus Christ and all of us as a, a team pulling on the same rope together. So I encourage you to come to that. We'll be in that for another four to six weeks. So let's go to the Lord and ask His blessing on our time in His Word. If you'll look with me in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 10. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love and give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, and devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints and practicing hospitality. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this glorious gospel, and I thank you now as Paul is beginning to um, give us direction for how do the redeemed children of God live for their Redeemer. God, how do we walk in a manner worthy of the calling that we have received? Teach us how to, to walk in your will and, and that pleasing aroma. Lord, help us to be those who love you and love others. And so, God, I pray that you continue working in each one of our hearts and lives. Lord, we desire metamorphosis. We desire change from the inside out. God, we know external change without internal is hypocrisy. And so we just pray that by the spirit that you've put within us, that you will continue to bring out these fruits into our lives. And I pray that we would be a, a bride that would um, reflect the bridegroom well. So Lord, meet us, bless us in the word of God this morning, we pray. Amen. Well, I'm grateful to the Lord for this section that we're studying as he's been putting me on an operating table and just cutting flesh that has overgrown my heart and enlarging it for him and others and seeking transformation for me, for you, earnest prayer uh, to the Lord to do this and that the Holy Spirit would grant this verse fuller to Southside Bible Church this morning. So let's take up our text. We've transitioned into Romans chapter 12. Uh, we started with a therefore, and we said the whole Christian life is based on that, that we don't live these, uh, these imperatives and these commands of God to get his favor. We, we begin with the full favor of God because of the work of Jesus Christ. You can't be any more loved or any more accepted than you are today by faith in Jesus Christ. That is how we enter in to live the Christian life, fully accepted, no condemnation, loved by our God. And so by the mercies of God, we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice because of these deep, rich, never-ending mercies of God in Christ Jesus. That is our motivation. That is what drives us now to this living for the will of God, offering our bodies up as living sacrifices. And verse two, that now we're learning the will of God through the Bible. We're learning what is it then that pleases God? How do I offer up my body a living sacrifice? God, show me. Show me from your word. What does that look like? How do I do that? You have my heart. I just show me then how to live for you for what you've done for me in this beautiful gospel. And we began in verses three through eight. We're seeing that as a body, we're one, we're united in Christ and all these gifts God gives to be a flow of grace to build us up 
and to the image of Jesus Christ. And so we come together and we use these gifts to, to, to build each other up to become more like that, uh, our head, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verses 9 through 21, we're in this section now of just how do we love. And Paul began with that title, Let Love Be Without Hypocrisy, where we begin now as we, for the first time by this gospel, can fulfill the law truly. And from the heart, we can love God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. Never perfectly to glory. We want to be growing and being transformed. But from the first time, we can love truly now because he truly has loved us in Christ. And we learned some definition to it the last time we were together. Uh, we abhor what is evil and we cling to what is good. And we saw that that's from the heart and that can only come from a new heart that God gives called regeneration, being born again. So I need a new heart and God gives that gift in the gospel. And now we abhor what he abhors and we cling and we cleave to what he delights in. And now this morning we'll take up in verse 11, uh, 10. So <clears throat> be devoted then to one another and brotherly love, give preference to one another in honor. So we're going to take up what I'm going to call family ties this morning. We are the family of God. We are an eternal family and we are a blood bought family. So when they say, you know, blood runs thick, uh, this runs thicker, the blood of Jesus Christ. You've been redeemed by it, and it brings us together as the family of God. God is our Father, Jesus is our brother, and the Spirit is uniting our hearts as one. We are the family of God. And I'm asking our Father if the reality of this would break even deeper into all of our hearts this morning for this beautiful outworking. Paul has called us in verse 9 to agape, that love that can only come from God. I can never give agape in my own resources. Agape must flow from the Spirit of God, and it's God's love flowing out into other lives. It's a supernatural love that the believer has now been brought into. This love has taken up our heart and again, we love what he loves and we hate what he hates because we're one heart now with God. And I do wish it was perfectly. My reach will always exceed my grasp, but we will keep uh, striving, striving in the, the power that God supplies to be conformed by the Spirit to live this way. Paul will exhort us to two things as we consider the family then this morning. And in verse 10, the first is we're going to maintain a tender affection for one another. And secondly, we're going to exercise a humble appreciation for one another. So if you'll look with me at the first one, maintain a tender affection for one another. Paul said, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. In the Greek, it's kind of an interesting translation. In brother love to one another, love tenderly and affectionately. This exhortation by Paul is just loaded with redundancy. It's our call for affection to, to rise up to one another, to have a brotherly love, to have a family love, to have a fond affection for each other. This is so big, and it's just such a great exhortation. It's not to, uh, to come into the family with a hypocritical love. You don't walk in here. It's not to be faked. It's not to turn on and turn off. It's God's kind of love. And this whole phrase, I don't really like them, but I love them, is garbage. This cannot be a distance, coldness, keeping yourself at bay, protecting yourself from being hurt in a body. This is a love from God. And this is the heart that God puts in us when he saves us. It's one that loves truly for the first time. One that by his spirit is taken up with these abundant mercies in Christ and now moves forward in humility. And it finds expressions in our lives toward the family, toward the family of God. And it's saying our brotherly love is to be family affectioned, to have kind affection for one another. It's an interesting word. It's two words, uh, philos, where we get the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And if you're from Philadelphia, you laugh at that title. <laughs> but Brotherly love with storge, which means family affection. So brotherly love with family affection. 
It's the deep bond that we would call the bond of family. And I know that we've all grown up with different families. And for some, this is so easy to connect, to say, I get that family kind of love. And some of you need the Spirit to teach you what God wants you to have for the brethren uh, because of the hurts and the pains that you've experienced. But earthly family ties can run deep. But what, what this is telling us is heavenly family ties run deeper. And it's what Paul is calling us to have for each other in the body of Christ. And I think that's what many of us feel this morning for our dear sister. That bond in Christ is deep. I have a brother who's very sick, and uh, he, he, needs, uh, he has dialysis, and he was going to die without a, a kidney, and he caught COVID, and it's messed with his nervous system, and uh, he's suffering great. If you could encourage him, I, I, I ask you to do that. But there's such a brotherly affection. But I have a dear brother in Christ who's giving him his kidney. That's, that's Phyllis Dorge. That is a, a love that is so beautiful. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 10. Paul says, Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. God teaches you this by His Spirit and His Word. For indeed, Paul says, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. It's coming out, but just if it's from God, let it become abundant. Let it excel still more. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, love without hypocrisy, fervently love one another, Peter said, from the heart, from the inside, for you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and abiding word of God. You've been born again to this kind of love, this fervent agape love that's not hypocritical, that can stretch. This is beautiful. This is the ground of our love for one another is the new birth that has come in Jesus Christ. It's given you your chief affection. And I just want you to consider this. The saints of God are his chief affection. <clears throat> Remember in Romans 8, those whom he foreknew, he predestined, whom he predestined, he called, and whom he called, he justified, whom he justified, he glorified. Foreknowledge was to set his love upon you in eternity past. And so you are the object of God's heart and affection. And he set his love upon you in eternity past. Romans 9, we saw, we labored in that, that God has electing love that he puts upon his children. The saints of God are the chief object of God's affection. We are the children of God with whom he delights, with whom we call him Abba, Father. Hesedness, this covenantal relationship with God that can't be broken. And so we, we are just God's objects. He has set his love upon us and we get his blessings for all of eternity because he foreknew us. And so we are, we are his choice. I pray the beauty of Romans 9 is still on your heart electing love that we are the apple of his eye. And now we come out of the womb, born again by his spirit, faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, alive from the dead, ready to love what God loves. And what does God love the most on this earth? His elect, his redeemed, his blood-bought children. Those, those are his, his preoccupation, you could say. And so as you look around this morning, get a good look. These are the objects of God's redeeming love. The person next to you, when you join this church, we, we hear your testimony. Have you been saved? And the best human ability is we look at it, yes. Have you been baptized saying, I'll follow King Jesus? And that's who you sit next to this morning. The deep, deep love of Jesus 
is, is upon us. For those whom Jesus bled and died, he died for us. And the chief affection of God is this gnarly bunch clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ this morning. We're the beloved of God. We're his choice. And now our hearts set our love on the redeemed of God. With the Father's love because his spirit dwells within us and he points us to the glories and excellencies of Jesus Christ, that is the fountain and the foundation of our love. The more you know his love, the more you will love. We have a love for the objects of his love. Brotherly, affectioned love for one another. Paul says, do do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The writer of Hebrews says, let the love of the brethren continue. And again, as we look out, there's some maybe here this morning that you're, you're angry. Some who have been really hurt and some who are really hurting. Some new believers and some seasoned old believers. Some self-righteous people who still look to their own righteousness and some deeply humbled people. Some strongly assured of their hope and some who are wavering this morning in their gospel hope. Some people who are so easy to get along with and some who are just so difficult. And Paul just looks out and doesn't make any generalizations. Just love each other with affection. Have a family love for all your siblings. Mom always did love you best. No. <laughs> he lo- we, just, we all love because he first loved us. And so I want you to hear this so clearly this morning. We are the beloved children of God. We all have one faith, one Lord, one hope, one baptism. The attachments that we have are not earthly. They're heavenly. We have the same Holy Spirit dwelling within us. We are joined to the same Savior. We're we're joined to Christ and all the blessings that flow from that we enjoy together. We're joint heirs with Christ. Of the same big brother, we're going to receive eternity together. We're the family of God. We're not a club. We're so much more than friends. We're family. And these relationships will last forever. All other relationships will cease. Do you think this way when you walk in on Sundays? Are you just marveling? Family reunion. I get to come be with my brothers and sisters. It's just a joy in my heart. Just notice what Paul says in verse 10. Be devoted to it. Be given to this kind of love. Let it be the preoccupation and desire of your heart. This is so much more than just liking each other. Even more than just being friends. Our souls are wrapped up in each other's souls in Christ. Have philostorge for each other. The cry to be fervent and tender and warmly devoted to each other. I love in Samuel, the soul of Jonathan, it says, was knit with the soul of David. Those God-loving hearts were just linked together. Listen to Paul in 1 Thessalonians 2. He's writing and he says, having thus a fond affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become so very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and our hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaimed the gospel of God. In Philippians 1, 7, For it is only right, Paul says, for me to feel this way about you, Philippi, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all have koinonia in grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. I long for you with this affection that's been put within me of Christ Jesus. And I pray that your love would abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. In 2 Corinthians 7, 3, Paul says, I do not speak to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. So this is why 
I like to call you brothers and sisters. It's not, um, it's, it's my reminder. Every time I see you of this great reality, I don't want it to ever be a cliche, a phrase. It's such a reality to me. You're my eternal blood bought brother or sister in Jesus Christ. It reminds me of how I should treat you and love you and be affectioned to you. And so I just say, Southside, you are blossoming in this. The love of the brethren has been so real and deep and growing. But may we excel still more, my dear brothers and sisters, in this. Before we look at this next phrase, I just wanted to deal with the question, how do I grow in this? I want to, I see it, Pastor, I want to grow in this. I don't want hypocritical love. I want this deep, real, God-wrought, brotherly affection that's not worked up. It's, it's supernatural. And so, are you ready for the answer? I bet you guys know what I'm going to say. Never get over Romans 1 through 11. I mean that. Don't get over Romans 1 through 11. That you were so alienated from God and under his wrath. Paul spared nothing in Romans 1 through 3 to make sure that every soul knew you are off and twisted from your head to your toes. You are selfish. You treasure everything other than God. You're broken. You're suppressing him. There is no hope of change. You can't change your nature. You will never be able to fix your state before God. And then he says, but now, God has done something to fix that. And he sent his son into the world, and he put him up on a cross, and he did bear the wrath of God for your sins. And he did live the life that God requires of us. He really did live that righteousness and it's put to your account so that now you can stand right and just before God by faith and not by works. You have peace with God. You stand in grace this morning. Never get over that. Don't get familiar with it. Don't let it drift. Fight for that all of your days. You were so undeserving of the mercy of God. Could you, can you ever get over it? I just was so convinced I deserved his wrath. I had no arguments. So I can't get over that I get, I'm getting mercy instead of wrath. Just live in that. Bask in it. Count your blessings. That little hymn, name your blessings, count them one by one, whatever it is. Uh, mercy will flow from the one who drinks up mercy. I read a, a long time back about a guy named William Beterwolf. William Beterwolf in the early 1900s told this story. He was a construction engineer and he was inspecting a building site. And he went up on a scaffold, I think it was about five stories high, it was up there. And as he was doing it, he slipped and he fell. And he's falling to an, abs an almost certain death. But there was a workman who was working below, uh, right underneath where he fell. And as he looked up and saw him coming, I shouldn't have looked up into those lights, I can't see anybody now. <laughs> Um, he braced himself and he just took the full impact of that falling man. And the engineer ended up only being slightly injured, but the workman was just driven into the con concrete. And it says that almost every bone in his body was broken from what he did that day. A reporter later asked him how the man he saved was treating him. And the crippled man's response was this. Well, he gave me half of everything he owns. He made me a partner in his business. He never lets me want for a thing. A day hardly passes that I don't receive some little token of his remembrance. What a beautiful story of gratitude. But th there was one on Golgotha who braced himself and he took on the full wrath of God for your sin. And by his wounds, you were healed. What gratitude should we have for Jesus Christ? And now, we're devoted to one another in brotherly love. If you're struggling with the family, a difficult brother or sister, you've lost sight of the cross. 
And we need to look by faith again to what Jesus Christ has done. One preacher said, mercy is the soil that affection grows in. Mercy is the soil that affection for one another grows in. And so Paul will exhort us to two things. First, maintain a tender affection for one another. And secondly, exercise a humble appreciation for one another. Look with me in verse 10. Give preference to one another, <coughs> excuse me, in honor. I'm excited to open this one up now. Oh, and we got plenty of time, so get ready. We hear a lot about love. Uh, this, this one that we're going to look at this morning isn't taught as much in the church. It's not a, in the forefront as much as it should be. And so may God bless us richly as we look into this this morning. It's not the easiest phrase to nail down, struggled with it. The ESV has translated it, outdo one another in showing honor. And it's this idea of, of really seeking to promote one another uh, and not my own glory. I, I, I want your glory. I want your honor. I don't spend all of my days trying to get my honor. Another translation says, in honoring one another, take the lead, be the example, set the pattern. Robert Haldane, a commentator, said, it translated this way, each one take the lead in showing healthy respect for one another. Healthy respect. Admire what God is doing in each one of our lives. It's, it's amazing what he's doing. It's the opposite of a critical spirit. A critical spirit looks at what God isn't doing all the time. And this kind of spirit just looks at, man, look what God is doing in that life. So honoring then is treating your brother or sister with this affectioned love by your words or your deeds that they appear worthy of your service. We're right back to Romans 12, 3 through 8. I, I, I treat you as you are worthy of me coming and washing your feet. You don't earn it. You become their servant. And in my quiet times, I've been in John 13, and I just can't get over the Son of God kneeling down and washing the disciples' feet, saying, I've set for you an example. I was meeting with a friend last week or two weeks ago and uh, going through some difficult times in his marriage. And he said, I think I get what you're saying. Instead of throwing in the towel, you're saying to take up the towel and wash her feet. I was like, man, I wish I could have said it that well. But... <clears throat> That's the idea I'm trying to get across. The call here is to outdo one another. What, what kind of competition would that be? <laughs> outdo one another and showing honor. Could you imagine what that would do to marriages? I just want to outdo you in showing honor. There was a theologian named Peter Sintera. And he said, I'm a man who will fight for your honor. That's what I want to do. I want to fight for your honor. Piper said, outdo is to prefer on the inside to honor rather than be honored. So it's, it's this internal thing again. I, I, I want you to be honored rather than me be honored. Not how do I get strokes. How do I give them? What would happen if we desired mostly to give honor rather than to receive it to the body of Christ? If you would, flip over to James 2. This one's always jumped out to me. <clears throat> the sin of partiality. In James 2.1, my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 1 through 11, with an attitude of personal favoritism. You're going to see that these two can't go together. The gospel of Jesus Christ and personal favoritism. And he gives an example. If a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there comes a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. 
Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you've dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you're fulfilling the, law, the royal law according to Scripture, the law of Christ, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And so when you show favoritism, what you're doing is you're looking out at something external and you think there's something that you can gain by their wealth or their, who they are, their person, their status. And I will show you favoritism because you can give me something. And, and it's a denial of the gospel because I have everything in Jesus Christ. You can't give me anything that I don't, I already have everything. So now I'm free to just love and to, to love everyone from any walk of life, any sphere. It sets you free to, to love and to not have personal favoritism, but really to, to be able to show honor to all people. So we don't have our favorite people. The ones like me, the ones who I, I just, I like to fellowship only with the same age. I only have, can have the same personality type, the same community group, the same race, the same socioeconomics, the same sex, the same education, the same job, the same hobbies. That's just all the garbage of the world. And in here, we, we show honor to all men and women and children. We go before one another and holding each other is precious. Blood bought children honor one another. I love the story about a man. He was very esteemed in Christianity for his service and gifts. And he was sitting on a platform with some other men waiting to speak. And, and, and the crowd started applauding. And, and they were applauding for him. But the man, without thinking, stood back and clapped for the guy sitting next to him. And it wasn't false humility. He just assumed if they're clapping, it must be for this man. I don't want to be honored. By this is a call to appreciate what God is doing in each one of our lives. It's God. It's not self-promotion, but humbly appreciating each other. I come back to David and Jonathan again. Jonathan clearly sees that God's hand of blessing is upon his friend David. And he's taking away this blessing from his lineage. And Jonathan has all the right to the throne and privilege of his father Saul. And he takes all of his authority, everything that represented it, and he just lays it at David's feet. Are we eager to recognize and appreciate one another? To prize one another for our gifts and graces and contributions to the body of Jesus Christ? And so I ask myself the same question, how can I do that? I bet you know the answer. Especially if you've been coming to Southside for very long. How can I grow in this? Envy and jealousy must die, but love, not looking for my honor, but being an unprofitable servant at best. And so God, I thank you for what all the saints are doing of their service. God, the gifts are growing us up into the head. Remember, everyone has a gift and together we build each other up into the head. So I, I treasure and I honor every gift that God has put in, into his redeemed. I honor it. And it's just such a blessing because we all, we all need it. Thank you for the beloved of God, your elect, the forgiven, the righteous, the spirit indwelt, the adopted, and what we see of Christ in them. Not criticizing and nitpicking. What is God doing in your life? We look at the graces working. And don't you just love seeing the saints of God growing? We're joint heirs together. We're going to inhabit the new heavens and the new earth together. So my, my dear brethren, how do we grow in this? There's so many in the body who don't seem worthy of honor. 
There's some who act disrespectful. How do I do this? How do I honor people who act dishonorable? I don't like how they act. I don't like how they treat their spouse. I don't like how they treat me. And first, I go back to Romans 1 through 3. If it taught me anything, I dishonored God. That's my title. Ken Murphy spent 21 years dishonoring God in every way that I could. I was so dishonorable. I suppressed God. I loved and evil and uh, hated what was good. I sinned daily against God. And what did he do? Did he do what I deserved? Did he throw me into the lake that burns with fire forever, justly and right? He honored me. And he gave me a name that is forgiven. Child of God. And he puts me in his family. He's honored me. David wanted to honor Jonathan after his death. And he said, is there any left to the family of Saul and his lineage? And there was only one, a lame man since his birth named Mephibosheth. And this man was not worthy of any honor. He was dishonorable. And David sought him out and he brought Mephibosheth into his palace and he had him eat at his table for every meal and he brought him into the family. The king. And God did that with me. Who was way more lame and poor than Mephibosheth. He honored me when I was so dishonorable. And now I sit at the king's table and I sup with him. <laughs> I'm his son. And I can't get over it. When Jesus comes and washes the feet then. But I want you to hear something amazing that a preacher pointed out to me last week. In Luke 12, 37, Jesus said, Blessed are those slaves whom the master shall find on the alert when he comes. And truly I say to you, here's the second coming of Jesus. When he comes, he will gird himself to serve, to wash feet and have them recline at the table and will come and wait upon them. Jesus Christ, the first time comes as a servant. The second time comes as the reigning king and he's going to wash feet. He's going to come and serve you at the tables. I pray that we could learn from our master to outdo one another in showing honor and not trying to get it. Walk in those footsteps. And so by faith, look at Christ. You are mercied and loved this morning by him alone. Let his love foster these family ties in you this morning with tender affection don't let weakness, hurts, idiosyncrasies, brokenness, differences come between anyone in the body of Christ. Hold together with all that we have in Christ and God will test it for your good and his glory. Keep the family flame burning. Repent of anything in your heart that is keeping you from this. It is fun to have a theology of love but it's another thing to love other people. Let the love of the brethren continue. And may we honor one another, outdo one another in showing honor. And that is how the church grew so fast uh, in the days of the apostles. And so when I look at verse 10, I just say Ruth Steffens. I look at it and she just, Stayed in that kitchen, serving, doing anything she could. And the sacrificial time and hours and all. And if you mentioned her name, man, you were in trouble. One day I, I tried to mention her name and God had me get mixed up and say Ruth Ortiz instead of Ruth Steffens. <laughs> and she was so glad that I messed up. And she outdid us in showing honor and washing feet and loving this body, and she was so family affectioned. And so we honor her uh, for the great example that she left for us. And, and as Christ did, uh, we would follow in those footsteps. And so as we 
close out, the one thing I learned yesterday is death will come. It comes quickly. And this is a very healthy young lady. And Joe said, I got up in the morning. I had no idea I'd be sitting in a hospital room with the elders around me praying for my wife that just passed. And it just comes quickly. And so if you've come here this morning, my, my big deal when I got saved was when I became afraid of death. And I started thinking about it. I, I, my best friend's sister at 19 was flipped over in a car and her neck broke. And I, I, I was unsaved sitting at that funeral just trembling for what if that was me. And I was, I was raised uh, in a way that I knew guilt I knew fear, I knew the wrath of God, and so I, I was scared to death. And so if you're here, um, it's appointed unto man once to die, and then comes judgment. You can take your vitamins, you can drive safe cars that have a five-star rating, you can do everything you want, but you will die. Okay? You're going to die. And you're going to stand before God. And the question is going to be, how am I ever going to stand in the presence of a God who's blazingly holy and just and said, I have to punish any sin? One sin, you're guilty of breaking the whole law of God. So if you hope for a scale or a graded curve, there's, there's no hope in that. And when you stand before this God, there, there is only one way you can ever have hope. And that's that God put his son up on a cross and he pulled out the sword of justice. And when our sins were put upon his own son, he looked at him and it says he didn't spare him. For I, I would have spared my son. But God loved us more. And he said he didn't spare his own son, but he poured out his full wrath for every sin that we ever committed on his own son until he breathed his last and died for sin. And he was buried in a grave dead. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead to show that he conquered death and sin and the enemy and fulfilled the law. And now there is salvation in no other name. Uh, Martha, do you believe this? Uh, if you believe this, you will live even if you die. And so there is hope for you this morning. There is hope in Jesus Christ. And the way we receive such a glorious salvation is not by works, not by working hard and changing yourself and being better, you look away from anything in yourself this morning and you look at Jesus Christ hanging on a cross in your place and you see your sins being forgiven by the work of Jesus on a cross. And so that is your hope this morning that if your death day is today, it'll be your best day. It'll be your chariot ride to glory. It'll be everything you've ever dreamed, hoped, or imagined. And so I pray that you get more by death than you got by birth. By birth, I was born into this howling wilderness. And by death, I will enter into the sweet presence of Christ forever, made perfect with the souls and the saints forever. Amen? Amen. To God be the glory for the most glorious gospel there is. Father, thank you that you so love this world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God, I pray if there are any who came in here without life that even now, in the quietness of their heart, they would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. God, I, I, I pray for the Stephens family. God, I ask that you meet them in their grief. Lord, I pray right now, even if they're with us listening, Lord, that you comfort your people. There's a pain that feels like it will never go away, but you will comfort. And you will, you're, you're Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals Heal up this beautiful family. Meet them, carry them. Do what they can't do themselves. Continue to grow that joy that they have of the hope of their mama and wife dwelling with Jesus. God, please work mightily in their lives. Let the body of Christ be so tenderly affectioned to them. We lost our own sister. God, we grieve and we care and we come alongside to help them. We, we grab the other side of this pole and we carry it with them. God, empower us to be your hands and feet to this family during this season. God, we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for a life well lived. How precious 
And the sight of God is the death of the righteous. God, we rejoice. And this Holy One and her, her culmination and her fulfillment. God, thank you. And it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.